chapter 2 with me tonight. Second Corinthians chapter 2 verse 10. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgive, for if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Father, I pray now, Lord, that you bless your holy word as it goes out. In Jesus' name, amen. I was reading this past week a little snipe, trite stay, saying by someone who is a Christian critic and a Bible critic, and he made the statement how that, boy, the devil must be some superhero or super being to be able to uh, inflict injury and pain and suffering and temptation on all the billions of people on the earth at the same time. You ever thought about that? That's why I say all the time, folks, you don't know the essence of a spirit. You do not know the essence of that spirit world. The only thing we know is physical because that's the world we've lived in. And we have the witness of the Holy Spirit in us because we're born again. But that's as far as it goes. You've never heard a Bible teacher or a uh, preacher or anyone of that nature uh, begin to expound on the essence of a spirit. And the reason they don't is because we don't know. And if one tries to do that, it's nothing but pure presumption. So when the scripture says in the book of Job, where have you been? He said, I've been walking to and fro, walking to and fro on the earth. How long does it take Satan to move from one spot to the next? I have no idea. But I do know this, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, right? Whether I understand it or not is irrelevant. I believe it. I believe the Bible, folks. I'm a Bible believer. Now I want to read a letter for you tonight. And this individual is going to remain anonymous. We get letters and emails all the time. She, uh, Miss Moreland is still sending me January emails. I think she said you've got 1,200. You've got 1,388 emails that have yet to be dealt with. Yeah, and... Uh, but now, folks, that's not bad. That's a good thing. But it is a, it is, it's a chore to deal with all this. But some come in that are absolutely critical. And what I'm going to read you tonight is a letter that is critical. Uh, this is dated 5-25-18, May 25th. Dear Pastor Lawson, I've been listening to your sermons on YouTube since a friend told me about them. I enjoy listening to you very much. I don't know if you answer letters, but I really need your opinion on something. I did answer her. I answered her today. Miss Moreland will get the letter out. In your Mother's Day message, which I assume was this year, you talked about women who have had an abortion. I, too, had an abortion many years ago. As I listened to what you said about this woman... You helped me to realize that my life is pretty much hopeless, worthless, and unredeemable. Do you think I should kill myself to make up for my baby's life? You said they will kill you just as surely as they killed their unborn baby. I don't want to be a danger to others. I appreciate you taking time to answer my question. Now, don't ask me who this is. This lady has a, a, a right to be anonymous. This was not a public letter. Uh, but what I read to you tonight could have come from 10,000 different women. As a matter of fact, the figure in America now, depending on where you get your, uh, the statistics, is anywhere from 50 to 70 million babies have been slaughtered in the good old U.S. of A. You need to think about that every night before you go to bed. And the next time you pray for God to bless America, remember that. Remember that. I don't want God cursing America, but I want America to wake up. Amen. Innocent blood is flowing in this country. 
And one of the ways the church deals with it is simply ignore it. Let it pass on by. It's not my problem, they say. It could be your problem with your granddaughter. Your problem with your niece. It's your problem with your wife. Or someone in your family can be your problem. It can happen. Well, my child wouldn't get pregnant. You live in la-la land. You need to plug yourself into 2018. You need to understand that the old man, and every one of us still has the old man, is capable of anything. Thank God for the new man. So therefore, I've got a battle that goes on. It rages daily between the old man and the new man. Amen. And once the battle ceases, one side or the other has won. When the battle ceases and you're no longer, in strug- no longer struggling, one side or the other has won. In America, there's been a battle for the moral conscience of this country for decades now. They won. That's hard to take, isn't it? So what do you mean by that? They're the ones who have your kids. They teach them in school. They brainwash them. They turn them against God. They turn them against Christ. And they turn them against you. I got an email from a lady in Canada the other day. The Canadians are our next door neighbors. A lot of good people up in Canada. We've had a lot of Canadians visit with us here at Temple. Good people. Love the Lord. She said, Preacher... She said, up here in Canada, if your children that you're raising in your home uh, decide that they are uh, a boy is a girl or a girl is a boy, and you try to stop them, they'll take your kids away from you. They won. Now it's up to the church to go back to its roots. What are we about? We're about helping people like this. This lady needs help. Most of the people in this country couldn't care less if she killed herself. They couldn't care less. They don't care. David said, no man cares for my soul. But it bothers me. Let me tell you why. She's vulnerable for the assault of Satan. Now, I want to look at a little Bible study with you tonight about some things that are very important. Very important. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. And let's look at it again. The apostle said, To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ. That word forgave, that English word forgave, is from the Greek word karizomai. The first half of that word is from the Greek word charis, which is grace. Grace. That's how the word's translated. In plainer words, one of the foundations, one of the basic foundations of forgiveness is based on grace. Unmerited. God doesn't forgive any of us because we deserve to be forgiven. You can't do anything for God to forgive you. You can't earn forgiveness. Now that's what uh, religion teaches. And the reason they teach that is because they take away from the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot, folks. Repentance will not get you forgiven. Forgiveness is not based on repentance. Forgiveness is based on the finished work of Christ. Repentance is a fruit of forgiveness. It's the fruit of belief. There's a lot of people out here, according to what the Apostle Paul said, the sorrow of this world worketh death. Why, good night. We have, in the Old Testament, we've got Pharaoh who repented. Pharaoh said, my goodness, what have I done? I've lost my firstborn. Turn these people loose. Let them get out of here. Yet his heart was not right with God because he hadn't changed. You see, people change because of their circumstances. They get tired of it. It hurts. Life is hard. So you say, well, that got him right with God. No, what makes you right with God is accepting God's word for what God said and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. When it comes to forgiveness, 
If you ever fall into the trap to where you think you've got to do something to be forgiven, you'll never be able to do enough. You never will. Satan will wire you out with it. Kiritsomai. It means grace to grant as a favor. Now that's one part of forgiveness, and that's a big part of it. The Bible said God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And hath committed to us the word of the ministry of reconciliation. Be ye reconciled to God. It's important to understand that it repentance, that forgiveness has nothing to do with the individual sin. It has to do with a sinner. You're following me. That's important. So why is it important? Because it doesn't matter what you've done. He can forgive you for it. You see, if the Lord drew up a, a, a list of things, well, I'll forgive you for this and I'll forgive you for this. But if you do this over here, you can't be forgiven for that. What about the unpardonable sin, preacher? Where do you go where nothing can be pardoned? There is a place you can go where nothing can be pardoned. Neither in this life nor the life to come. When you've made that final rejection of Christ and rejected the Holy Ghost, said no to God's grace, don't want any part of it, no to Him. There's no forgiveness because you've rejected it. Here's the second part of it. Now remember, Kiritsumai is this part of the grace of God giving you repentance based on His grace. When God forgives us, He forgives us based on the blood covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here's another aspect of forgiveness, and this is an important part of it too. Look at Ephesians chapter number 1 and verse number 7. Ephesians 1, 7. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. See that? See forgiveness based on grace? But here's another element involved in another perspective. The Greek word translated forgiveness here is aphesis. Aphesis. That word means to offer a pardon. Now President Trump just recently pardoned some people. And the way he's talking, he intends to pardon more. See? What's a pardon? A pardon is something offered to you by a higher power and that has the, has the legal authority to make you free of the penalty of what you've done. Let's say I go to your jail cell and you're locked up in prison and I walk up to the door and I say, I've got good news for you. Here's a pardon. This is a forgiveness for what you've done to society. You have a pardon. And you look back at me and you say, Oh, I'm not going anywhere. I like it here. I mean, i got three meals a day, a place to sleep. And, you know, this is home. Well, here's a pardon. All you have to do is accept the pardon. And you're forgiven for all that you've done. See the aspect? See the perspective now? See how the forgiveness has taken on, a, has taken on not a new meaning, but... but but a complementary meaning to the grace of God that gives it based on the finished work of the Lord Jesus. Remember that, folks. There is no forgiveness outside the finished work of Christ, the blood covenant. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. See that? The forgiveness of sins is based on the blood covenant of Christ according to the riches of His grace. This means that a pardon is offered to you. Why aren't people forgiven then, preacher? Because they won't accept it. Some folks like to wallow in self-guilt and self-pity. They do. Some people think that makes them humble. It doesn't make you humble when you reject the pardon from Christ, the forgiveness of your sins, and the finished work at the cross at Calvary. That doesn't make you humble. That makes you a rebel. You're rebelling against what God did for you. What God did for us, nobody else could do for us, folks. 
Salvation is not God saving you with your help. See what I mean? That's your own self-righteousness coming to play. That's you wanting to take partial uh, credit. That's you entering into the picture. God doesn't need you. <laughs> he doesn't need man or anything man's got to offer. God was in Christ reconciling the world into Himself, not asking them any questions, not taking any counsel, not calling any meetings. When God Almighty the Father was in Christ the Son, He established a covenant and God the Father put forth a palm leaf or put forth a, 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 a what do you call it? A palm branch. So mankind could be at peace with God. God did that. He's the one who initiated it. He's the one, as they'd say in a court of law, who took the action. It was God the Father that did that. And so somebody comes to the Lord and they say, well, you know, I don't know if I feel bad enough about my sin and I'm not so sure that I don't need to do some changing here. And, uh, you know, I need to get some things straightened up and, 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 uh, and, and until I'm ready to do that, I, you know, there's not going to be any forgiveness for me. Oh, so you're going to help God out. That's what you're telling the Lord. You're telling the Lord that what He did at the cross at Calvary for you to be able to forgive your sins based on the finished work of Christ and the blood covenant is not enough. Now that sounds humble coming from you or me, but it's not humility, it's rebellion and it's arrogance. So why, why am I not forgiven then, preacher? Because maybe you won't receive the pardon. <laughs> I mean, if I, was locked, if, I was, if I was locked up down here at Brushy Mountain, and you're, you talk about a hell hole, that's a hell hole. I've been down there. Man, what a thing. We used to go down there on Sunday and visit years ago. Go down there and preach to those men, witness to them. And that's, that's quite a place. And uh, to be locked up at a place like that, and then somebody offer you freedom, but not just freedom. Look, when I forgive you, I'm going to change you. Because the forgiveness brings changing. See, there's another Greek word here, and it's this one. Uh, over here in uh, Colossians 1.14. Look at this one. Colossians 1.14. In whom we have redemption through His blood. There He is saying the same thing in a different passage. In whom we have redemption through His blood. Even the forgiveness of sins. Afi Amy. Forgiveness of sins. I've, we've had three words now. All of them mean the same thing, but just a little different perspective. What is this? This is an intensive form of offering a pardon. A pardon. Wouldn't you want to be pardoned? Well, I'll tell you what. I, Lord, sorry, low down as I am, and you know, all I've done, I need to pay for my sins. You're not going to pay for them. That's arrogance in the face of God again. If you think anybody is in hell right now paying for their sins, then you're looking at the cross at Calvary and you're saying the finished work of Christ was not enough. we got to go pay for it. Who are you paying and what are you paying with? Your tainted blood? Your cursed life? Well, then who paid for my sins? Somebody answer me. <laughs> well, he only paid for the elect. Is that so? That's what John Calvin taught. Who did he, whose sins did he pay for? Everyone. If he paid for them, why would you need to pay for them again? They are paid for. Paid in full. Hallelujah to God. Amen. You could, you could suffer in hell for a million years and still not pay for your sins. Christ paid for them. Christ paid for them. And the payment that he made was one time he offered himself one time for sins forever. And is sat down at the right hand of the Father. Sat down because his work is finished. So then that means that God did everything that needed to be done about sins. Amen. <laughs> That's exactly what it means. It means that God the Father, before he, before, the, before he ever made the first man, did everything that was necessary to do away with the power, the penalty, and everything else that sin, its curse... He did away with it through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't preach enough about that, folks. There's too much preaching. There's too much stuff in the pulpit today. 
that caters to people's feelings and how you have a part in your redemption. And it makes you feel good and it sounds good. But it's, it's, it's heresy. It's pure heresy. The Lord Jesus, you don't need to add it. You can't add anything. You try to add anything to what Christ did on the cross. And that's arrogance and rebellion in the face of God. So, Afi Amy means an intensive form of sending forth. You've got a pardon tonight. If you're guilty of murder, where should you go? Where do murderers go? They go to hell. Where do you read that at, preacher? Revelation. <laughs> That's where murderers go. Well, how can I stay out of hell? Good question. Amen? We ought to have the answer to that tonight. How does a murderer stay out of hell? Is, is the blood of Christ powerful enough to cleanse murder? Well, what, 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 what do I need to do, preacher? I'm a murderer. What, what's my part? I mean, i got to do something. This is a heinous thing that I've done. Surely that... Sure, you mean just believe on the Lord Jesus and that, and that and I'm justified by doing that? Yeah. Therefore, being justified by... We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what the word means when you're saying that you're justified by faith? It means that you are putting trust in the character of God. And when you refuse to put trust in the character of God, you are diminishing God Almighty. And any time you tear God down, you're doing it to build yourself up. And it all looks so humble, and it all looks so religious, and it all looks so good. You know what penance is? And repentance? Say they're the same thing. Oh, no, 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 no. They are worlds apart. What's repentance? Repentance is the fruit of saving faith and accepting forgiveness from God. If you have really accepted that, and that will be my next point here in a moment, but if you have accepted the forgiveness that God offers, it changes you on the inside. And the change on the inside begins to empty you from the inside and you begin to rejoice in the fact that you're not what you used to be. And then you turn away from the world that you were part of. Your friends are no longer your friends anymore. You're a new man in Christ Jesus. And repentance begins to flow from your soul. Amen. 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 This crowd today that, say, that says repentance has nothing to do with the Word of God or with our age today or with the Gospel or whatever they're trying to say. They're going to give an account to the Almighty for it one day. Because they need to do a little more study into the Scripture. I declare you the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, how Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. I told you about a man who told me one time, he said, Preacher, I kill people in war. About 35, 40 years ago, I took my tapes to a radio station. He was sitting there that night. He said, Preacher, i got to talk to you. I said, Okay. He said, It's eating me up. He said, It's eating me alive. I said, What is? What is? What is it? He said, I killed people. I killed people in war. I killed them. And I just don't feel like God's forgiven me. And I'm afraid to die because I don't know where I'm going. What would you say to him? Well, you'd say, well, do the best you can. It'll be okay. I mean, God knows if you mean well. You know, try to live the best you can for the rest of your life and hope that, uh, hope that, hope that your good life will outweigh your bad life. That's... Uh, that's a weak and beggarly assault on the finished work of Christ. Well, then what do you tell him, preacher? 1 John 1, 9. I know you know it. But look at that scripture very carefully with me tonight. There's a word in there that I want you to look at carefully. 1 John 1, 9. It's important. 1 John 1, nine. If we confess. See that word confess? Confess. Now in my, in my Bible I've got a little note. It says admit. The English word admit. That's a very weak word for what this word is. Very weak. Very weak. The word is homologia. 
You know what a lagia is. Lagos. What's lagos? It's a word, right? Lagos. Homolos. You know, a homosexual of the same sex. That's what the Greek word means. Homo. Homolos means of the same. Heteros means of different. A heterosexual is the normal. A homosexual is an abnormal. Homologia means of the same word. Okay? Notice, it's just the word. 1 John 1 9, if we confess, if we homologia, if we agree with the word of the one speaking to our soul, are you following me now? Notice, not a thing is said about doing anything. Are you following me now? You're going to get forgiveness here in 1 John 1. But there's not a word about anything you do. It has to do with what you accept from God. If we agree with the Holy Spirit who is stirring our soul and convicting us of our sin, convicting us of what we've done, we say, Lord, I'm not going to make excuses anymore. I don't care if the whole world says it's all right. It's eating me alive. And I've got to have peace with God. And you're telling me that what's going on inside my soul and what I'm doing is wrong. I agree with you. It's wrong. And I confess it to you. And cover me by your precious blood. I plead the blood covenant upon my sin. Do you understand what that says? I'm pleading the finished work of the cross at Calvary for what Christ did for me to cleanse my sin, take the guilt away, and make me free. Hamalagia. I agree with you, Lord. I agree with what you're saying to me. I agree with you. What have you done, preacher? You've cast yourself again upon the character of God. And let me tell you something. Nothing gets more personal with God than His Word. How can you say <laughs> that you believe God or believe in God and you love the Lord and you don't love His Word? And you don't believe His Word? Well, then what is your faith based on? Groundhog Day? <laughs> February the 2nd? They come out in their tuxedos, high hats, and they pull the groundhog up. If he sees his shadow, then what have we got? Well, six, eight weeks, six weeks, eight weeks of more bad weather, right? If he doesn't see it. So you're hoping for a cloudy day, right? Did you believe there's an awful lot of Christianity that's about to like that? <laughs> Based on Groundhog Day. That's the truth. Just based on how you feel. Just based on nothing. Just, you know, well, so-and-so said so-and-so, and I saw what happened to so-and-so. What did God say? Folks, how many of you have ever done something in the past that you sure don't want to get up here and tell everybody about? And let me tell you something. If you're wise, you'll be awful careful about who you tell anything to. You will. You'll be very careful about it. The only one you ought to bear your soul to is God. Because if you start bearing your soul to another human being, you're bearing your soul to one who has feet of clay just like you. That's exactly right. But you bear your soul to God. And you can do that. And He won't reject you. Because <laughs> this, is one of the good, this, is one of, this is one of the things that just goes against human thinking. The more you bear your soul to God, the closer you get to Him. <laughs> He'll never put a hand up and push you away and say, hold on, I didn't realize you were that low down. <laughs> I remember a man told one time, he said he was ministering in the prison. He said he was going from, going from door to door like Donnie Moore. You remember, how many of you remember Donnie Moore? Donnie Moore is the, is, the, is the man of God that got Robert Gibson saved. Unsung, one of the unsung heroes, Donnie Moore, faithful man of God. But anyway... He was going from door to door to door to door in the prison house. And he was witnessing. And he went to this one door. And the guy came to the bars. And he started talking to him. And, and they had began to build a rapport. There was, there was a relationship with him. You know, a warmness began to develop between the two men. Because he was telling him, you know, uh, opening his life up to him. And then he got to the point where he told him what he had done to wind up in prison. Now, I'm not talking about Donnie Moore. 
I'm talking about somebody else who told this story. This is not Donnie Moore, so please don't misunderstand me. But this man told him what he had done, and the minister backed away. He was repulsed. It was such a shock to him that a human being could do what this man had done. He was repulsed by it. And he said that that man turned away from him at that moment, and it wasn't long before he committed suicide. You know why? Because there was no hope for him. He was unredeemable in his own eyes. He had committed a sin that God would not forgive him for, he thought. He thought. But would God forgive him? There are things, folks, that human beings would have a hard time dealing with. I understand that. Absolutely I understand that. But, you know, it's not the human being's forgiveness that gets you in glory. It's God's forgiveness. So, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just. Faithful has to do with His character. Just has to do with theology. He's faithful in the sense that God cannot lie. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden. Now, I'll take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I'll give you, and I'll, I'll give you rest. That is God's character. But the just part has to do that He's the just and the justifier of him that believeth on Jesus. He has to have a theological, He has to have a right grounds to be able to forgive you. He's a holy God. He can't overlook sin. He can't just pass it off and say it doesn't mean anything. So how does He do it? He does it through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was the vicarious offering, the one who was given for all mankind. The Lord Jesus Christ bore the sin of the world. My, 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 my. How many of you, ever, how many of you saw that movie, The Passion of Christ? Did you see at the beginning of that thing? Where He's out there praying? And that serpent. And then this figure appears and says to him, You can't handle all the sins of the world. To paraphrase him, you can't do it. They're too great. And then he stomped the head of that serpent. And he went on his way and he went to the cross and there he died. Not just for a small elect group. He turn over here in Hebrews two. Hebrews two. I'll have to find it. It's in the second chapter of Hebrews. Let's see. And Here he is. For as much, verse 14, then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same through death. He might destroy him, power of death, the devil. Delivered the very took not, therefore in all things. Nine. There it is. Thank you. That he by the grace of God should taste death. For a few. See what I mean? It's over and over and over and over and over again in the New Testament. The, 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 the atonement is for all of mankind. Right? That includes the murderer. That includes that, whoever. Whatever. The worst sinner that ever walked the face of this earth. Christ died for him. I want to emphasize this again, but I'll shut up tonight because this is what is so important. First John 1 John 1.9 If we confess, it doesn't say if we do penance. In other words, it doesn't say if we burn 50 candles or if we, if we make a pilgrimage or if we do some good deeds or if we, you know, whatever else that you, that you might say, that's penance. If we crawl on our hands and knees through broken glass a quarter of a mile and all this, that's penance. We're doing something, see, that helps in our forgiveness. He said, if you confess, you'll forgive. Isn't that wonderful? 
for the man who's in a wheelchair or the woman in a wheelchair. Let's say they're quadriplegic. They can't use their hands. They can't use their feet. They're immobile. They can't go out and they can't do anything. But they can be forgiven. So what do I need to do, preacher? You do the same thing that I tell this lady here. Ma'am, you are not hopeless. You're certainly not worthless. And you are redeemable. And Edna's going to send her a letter back. And the letter I told her to tell this lady, when you come through this, you will be able to help other women who've had an abortion. Only, only another woman can understand what a woman goes through with that. I told my wife that the other day. I said, a man could never understand that. A man could understand the loss of a child, yes. But a man could never understand what a woman feels that's had an abortion. Because a child has been taken from her womb. She's carried that child. A woman has a connection with children a man will never have. Because she's the mother of these children. They came forth from her body. She carried them for nine months. She felt them kick. She felt their little heart beat. She, she knew there's a little human being in here. So she no longer was living for herself. She's living for her child. That's a mother. And so, you know, one of the worst things in the world could happen to a mother is to kill her baby. To kill her children. You see how sick this culture is? This sick crowd out here wants to judge you? <laughs> Man. Man. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, they want they want to find life, because if they find life, then that that it moves it moves it from just the earth being his footstool, because the Bible says it's his footstool. And here God works out the plan of redemption and settles the issue with mankind. They want to spread it out, and that also helps with evolution, the idea about Mars and all that other foolishness. It's beautiful. You go up and you look down at Earth. You see this blue planet out here. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. It's, it takes your breath away. I mean, I've watched, the, I've seen the photographs, the videos, and so forth that, that that they've taken of the Earth. Here it is, sitting out in space. It's a beautiful thing. It's a blue planet. It's beautiful. But when you get down here, it's not so beautiful, is it? <laughs> see, there's problem down here. What's that problem? S I N. What's the remedy? The Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good. Yeah, that. Yeah, that's a good analogy. It is. Yeah. And when I say to, uh, she misunderstood misunderstood me in the letter. She thought I was saying that all these mothers that have their babies killed will kill you. That's not what I mean. What I mean is the ruling elite. The ruling elite, the brainwashers, the social engineers, the fourth estate is part of it. The ruling elite will kill you in a heartbeat. Don't kid yourself. Yes, they will. Father, in thy name we pray. Bless your holy word. Somebody tonight or somebody watching this thing right now or somebody watch it later might very well have needed this because they may very well be at the end of their rope. It may be over for them, they think. And it may have no hope. Oh, if they could see how beautiful our Lord Jesus is. If they could just see that hand that will reach down, take hold of their hand, forgive them, cleanse them, and make them new in Christ. If they could only realize that He came to seek and save that which is lost. He's still seeking and saving that which is lost. If they could only see it's about the Lord Jesus. It's not about us. It's not about our church. It's about the Son of God. May they see that. May they know it. In Jesus' name. And keep your heads bowed tonight for just a moment. God really impressed my soul with this message. If you're in here tonight and you need prayer, just raise your hand and I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you over here. God bless you over here. God bless you there. God bless you over there. Got hands going up in here. God bless you back there. God bless you over here. I'll pray for you. Edna gives me a stack of letters, sometimes that thick. And I'll take them up into that prayer closet and I'll lay those letters down on the floor and I'll get down there and turn the light out and put my hands on those letters and pull that right up as near to my heart as I can and I'll pray over them.
God can answer prayer. God can answer prayer. Anybody else? Anybody else? God bless you. Anybody else? Father, Lord, it's a great privilege to come before you. And Father, tonight I accept the forgiveness that you offer. I accept the pardon that you give. And I accept the grace that gives it. I accept it, Father. I know, Lord, I don't deserve it. And I can't do anything to deserve it. I'm not good enough for it. But I believe it. And I've accepted it. And it has changed my life. Because that allowed the Holy Ghost to come into my soul. Father, I pray for these folk who raised their hand tonight. I pray for them. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you give them the wisdom they need to know the enemy when he's trying to deceive them, sift them, tear them apart, destroy their lives. Our Heavenly Father, when he paints an ugly, lying picture of you, our enemy's a liar and a deceiver. Father, I pray tonight that you give them wisdom. Lord, I pray tonight, Heavenly Father, for this grace of God that I preach tonight would really reach down, take hold of their heart. And our Heavenly Father, they'd realize, Lord, there's nothing they can do about forgiveness. They just have to accept the one who's already done it and receive your word. Receive your holy word. You tell us in Scripture to receive the engrafted word, which is able to save our souls. I pray for them. And I pray for this dear lady that wrote this letter. I pray for her tonight in Jesus' name. I pray for her. I pray, Lord, that you'd move in her heart, that she'd receive the truth and realize that you died for her like you did for me and all the rest of us. And there's nothing that she's ever done in her life that you can't forgive her for. And you will forgive her. And you have forgiven her in Christ. If she'll accept Christ and accept that payment and that pardon that's offered through the Son of God, she accepts forgiveness at the same time. I pray this in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake I ask it. Amen. 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 Amen.